Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Tuesday, the 15th of November, 2016. Let's take a look at the large scale, the global sea surface temperature anomaly map. I wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, this was updated yesterday, so it's very current. You notice here in the tropical Pacific, we do have this La Nina pattern in place. We also have a very cold area of anomalies up in the northern Pacific. And as a whole, the Pacific has cooled off uh, over the last several weeks and months, whereas the Atlantic Basin, with the exception of this one area right here south of Greenland, still remains fairly warm. We have this arc of either at or above normal warmth, and it, it extends all the way over to the western basin, then it kind of circles back around again. Whereas in the Pacific, we have definitely cooled the equatorial region, especially compared to where we were last year, and then we have started to develop this very cold area in the northern Pacific. And so overall, the Pacific decadal oscillation numbers are dwindling, they're declining, and are either close to or below zero right now. Um, so we're you know kind of teetering around the negative PDO state, whereas the Atlantic, for the most part, is in a positive AMO state. And what does all this mean? Well, to put it in very simple terms, the Atlantic Basin is generally warmer than it should be, while as of late, only in the last few weeks or so, the Pacific is a little bit colder than it should be overall. And that has some very interesting things that have happened. First of all, we've had a busier Atlantic hurricane season with some fairly high impact events for land areas, all right? And we're probably going to have another system developing. And this La Nina pattern down here sort of cuts off the big time stream of moisture that can come out uh, and into the southern United States, especially during the winter, along that southern winter storm track. And that has helped to sort of feed this drought over the United States. It's not directly responsible, but it certainly is a piece of that puzzle. So we'll be keeping an eye on this over the next several weeks and months as sea surface temperatures and where they are relative to normal seem to play an obvious role in not only what happens in the hurricane seasons and uh, for the Pacific and the Atlantic, but also what happens in lower 48 weather. So we'll be watching this closely, especially during the off season from December through May. So speaking of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, that's what ENSO stands for, El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is the latest forecast. This was updated on November the 10th. And generally speaking, neutral conditions are favored over the next several months, although these time frames out here are way out in time, even for some of these more sophisticated models. And you get into what's called the predictability barrier, especially in the spring, the northern hemisphere spring, and a lot can certainly change. We'll have to keep an eye on things such as the southern oscillation index. If that goes strongly negative and stays there, that could indicate some westerly wind burst activity, which helps to drive warmer conditions in the Pacific. We have to look at the subsurface temperatures in the Pacific. Basically, there's a lot to keep up with, but that's what I do in the off season, and it you know makes for a not so boring December through May. So all that being said, the probability of El Nino by next hurricane season here solidly into those months in June, July, and August stands at around 30 percent. So let's see how this evolves over the next several weeks and then that of course evolves into the next several months. As of current conditions, well we do have our disturbance down here in the Southwest Caribbean now with an 80 percent chance of becoming at least a tropical depression over the next several days and if we click on the X you can see the satellite picture in association with that. You can also see the very strong upper level winds cutting across the deep tropics as well as up here into the subtropics. Um, pretty much north of this line, hurricane season is basically over for you. But down here in the Western Caribbean, things can continue to percolate. And that's what we have. I showed you yesterday the points of origin has a few areas down here over the past 100 plus years. Once in a while, you get a favorable upper level environment. Water temperatures, temperatures are still very warm in this region and you just have to have a pre-existing disturbance and the opportunity presents itself for something to develop. Now you notice 
it's still a fairly disorganized, but certainly looks a lot better than it did yesterday. It's slowly getting its act together. And that's typically what we see this time of year. These things don't usually rapidly intensify until sometimes they get going. Then they can really ramp up over this very warm upper ocean heat content that resides in this area. But we look at the land masses in the vicinity of this system. We have Jamaica here, uh, the western part of the uh, island of Hispaniola, and the Cayman Islands just as reference points. And then, of course, we have Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. All of these areas should certainly be keeping an eye on this system because, remember, rainfall, I believe, is our number one enemy with tropical cyclones, followed strongly, very closely, by storm surge. To me, there's so much emphasis put on wind that the rainfall being the biggest hazard overall. I mean, you think about Hurricane Mitch in 1998 and all the lives that it took in this region here. And over the centuries, the lives that have been lost in Haiti due to rainfall. All right. And so that needs to be really emphasized that even as a depression, if this only makes it to depression status, the rainfall potential for some areas of the Caribbean, and it's hard to pinpoint exactly where because I think this is going to kind of meander for a bit, but we need to be keeping an eye on what happens with rainfall. So you folks in Jamaica, I know I have quite a few people that watch the updates in Jamaica, uh, maybe the Cayman Islands, possibly Haiti, but I'm more concerned about Central America. Some of the modeling indicating this kind of festers around and then maybe heads towards Central America, but that is not set in stone yet. As far as any impacts up here to the lower 48 or mainland Mexico, I see no reason to believe that this will make it that far to the north. And you can see up here too, just from the satellite picture, no precipitation to speak of for some of these areas in the drought-stricken southeast, which I will address more in just a moment. Looking at the upper level winds, there's the outline of that upper level anticyclone meaning it's favorable. Upper level winds are light and they are fanning out in a clockwise fashion instead of going across the system like that. Uh, so we put a check mark down here for upper level winds. That would be favorable. The vorticity or spin or energy at the 5,000 foot level, what we call the 850 millibar vorticity, eh, really not too strong right now, but again, this system still in its formative stages, but we'll watch as this evolves over the next few days and starts to get more of that rounded look. We'll see if that happens, and that if it does, it shows a sign of strengthening and a sign of organization. So with all that, let's take a look at the old GFS. Let's go back to the first frame of it. And I'll put this in the motion. Today we're going to look at the next five days. And as I scroll down, let's speed it up just a little bit so we don't sit here all day waiting for this. So here we are out. Uh, roughly day one and two, here's our system. And we are looking at the 850 millibar area of the atmosphere. And there's that very limited area of energy, that little yellow blob. Not much energy or spin associated with it. Moving on through the hours here. Um, 72 hours, we're at day three. I had to look down here to find it. It'd be nice if the timestamps were bigger sometimes. So as we get on out here to day four and day five, it starts to consolidate a little better. Uh, getting pretty close down here to Panama and Costa Rica, though. And again, that's what I'm talking about. This rainfall could be a big issue. So let me just go back up to the top, and let's fast forward to the last frame. At day five, it still doesn't look very organized. You can certainly see a counterclockwise spin in the uh, wind barbs here. Um, but... You know, it's going to take its sweet time. might be over the weekend and then into early next week before this starts to really get going. And that being said, if this gets close enough to Central America down here and Costa Rica and Panama, it could dump copious amounts of rain from time to time. But the good news, we don't see any of this energy bleeding up here towards Jamaica or Haiti just yet. So not too much of a risk overall unless... The GFS just doesn't have a good handle on this. So we just have to watch it and see what happens. And I'm going to say it one more time. Please be advised about that potential heavy rainfall. Now, let me point out something to you. Up here in the southeast, uh, where rainfall is desperately needed, especially parts of the southern Appalachians, and um, or Appalachians, some people say either, uh, northern Alabama as an example, 
Some of these areas are in some dire drought situations. The wildfires up here, some of the worst ever. Some people comparing them to the Southern California wildfires that we've seen. And it's just not good. So what's been the reason? Well, generally speaking, we've had this pretty big ridge of high pressure over the southeast uh, pretty much all summer. It's been fairly dry for the interior, wet along the coast from tropical activity. But because the western edge of that high pressure area uh, extended enough to keep systems from getting all the way back to the mountains. In other words, we didn't have any tropical systems coming through and cutting in like that. That could have helped with some copious amounts of rainfall. But basically this Bermuda High was set up just so, so that the coast stayed wet, but the interior areas, Piedmont, and then areas inland from there have stayed very dry. And if you notice on this GFS shot here at day five as an example, look at the flow here over the southeast. It's generally out of the northwest and north-northwest, and then from straight north to straight south. And that's not where your moisture comes from, generally speaking. Here's your big moisture source down here. It's called the Gulf of Mexico. So what we need to have happen is a nice trough to dig in here and switch the flow out of the south and bring in some copious amounts of deep moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, which, as I showed you, is running above normal right here. All right. So we have to tap this because I don't think the Pacific is going to be of much help. So we really need to get into this area here, put a tap on it, so to speak, and try to draw that up into the southeast United States. And we're going to need a pretty good longitudinal trough to dig in here like this and pull some of that moisture out of the Gulf. And until we see that happen, the map is going to continue to look like this. This is the um, day seven for the next seven days quantitative precipitation forecast. Fancy way of saying how much rain is going to fall over the next seven days. And for you know you folks here in the mountains, very little. Northern Alabama, some relief, but not much. And then the southeast continues to stay dry. No really noticeable amounts of rainfall for the coastal plain and all the way down into Florida uh, as we progress through the next uh, five to seven days. And a lot of this is the La Nina pattern overall. But remember, everything's connected, and you can't point to one singular event unless there's like a hurricane if you have a big flood well, then you can point to a hurricane and say, well, that's the reason why, or a dying tropical storm or whatever. But the drought over the southeast is sort of a culmination of several different factors coming together, and this La Nina pattern is not going to help. There will be periods where you get some rain, and in fact, probably have more snow than rain in the Appalachians, Appalachians, whichever, the, uh, the mountains of the east, before you get uh, any doses of heavy rainfall, unfortunately. So... You know, what can I say? That's just the pattern we're in. All right, so lots to keep up with here, even if the tropics are mildly interesting. There's other things to keep an eye on, like I talk about. And, um, you know, before you know it, the season will be over. And then we'll be talking about next season, and that'll go by very quickly as well. Trust me, I do this every year, and it does. It always goes by fast. All right, well, that's it for me for today. Have a great rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to this rather lengthy discussion, but there was a lot to talk about, so hopefully you learned something from it. I am Mark Suddeth for HurricaneTrack.com, and I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.